so let me introduce, uh, possibly uh, start with the uh, gentleman to, to my right here, who may not be known to many of you. Ray Bassett is a, a, a clinical biochemist by training, but became quickly a, a diplomat and has just retired after 39 years in the service of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. He was very much involved with the Irish team in the Good Friday negotiations. And just to prove how um, governments can be ungrateful masters or mistresses, he's fallen out with them over some comments he's made recently about Brexit. I'm sure we'll hear that, uh, much more about that uh, in a little while. Patricia McBride, a former Victims Commissioner, now a political commentator, well practiced to be, or well qualified to be a Victims Commissioner. Her brother was in the IRA and he was shot dead by troops in 1984. Uh, to my extreme left, Alex Kane, a former uh, Ulster Unionist spin doctor not to be seen to be representing the views of the DUP this evening, <laughs> now a political writer and commentator, currently celebrating the birth of Indy Atticus, his son. Uh, he's, what, a couple of months, Alex is at the beginning of his 60s, so it's, uh, he's a brave man. <laughs> I can still <laughs> stand <right. laughs> And Michelle O'Neill, of course, Sinn Féin's Queen of the North. Um, <laughs> Whether she'll ever rule the six kingdoms of uh, Fermanagh, Tyrone, Derry, and from Diner Armagh remains to be seen, but uh, that's tonight's panel, ladies and gentlemen. Big round of applause, please. <laughs> okay, let's be having you. Hands up. Yes, sir, front row. No more deaths on our streets, it says in your T-shirt. So let's go to you first, uh, Ray. Is uh, Donald Trump, I guess, uh, a threat to world peace? Well, um... <clears throat> That's a good question. That means I'm trying to think. Uh, <laughs> obviously, the whole situation has changed with Trump and arri has arrived. And what people are saying is we need strategic patience with, with Trump because we're going to have to get through the next four years. And the United States is a very, very important country, very, very important country for Ireland. There's no doubt that the West uh, in general, and particularly the United States, the intervention in place like the Middle East has been a disaster, and everybody accepts that. Um, so... <clears throat> The trouble out in the world is there are not that many good guys. And you look around and you say the United States does such and such. And um, But if you also look at some of the other uh, world powers, I mean, China wouldn't be particularly good on human rights. Uh, Russia has actually got sanctions against Ireland. Uh, so it, it wor works that way. I think we're in a very, very difficult situation at the moment. And it requires um, calm heads. And we're really relying on the sort of adults in the room in the United States to, to make sure that the, the present um, rhetoric is not translated into uh, action. I guess one of the things we have to deal with is that the closest people to the president in the White House are now military men. And in fact, uh, a lot of people think that that may be a good thing because the military men have at least a bit of discipline and somebody said that their main task but They now, like to go to war, don't they? They not really, well, and one of the, the American military have been very critical of Obama over the fact that Obama has got, uh, well, particularly the Bush period, that they've used military power far, far too easily and without any exit strategy. Military people like to have a defined uh, objective, like to get in and get out, and that hasn't been happening with the West. So, you know, the, the, the present military people who are there, certainly the feedback seems to be that they are probably the restraining part of, of the administration. Now, that you may find that a bit, <laughs> a bit disconcerting, but the military people seem to be the most sane in the, in the White House at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I quite understand that. That's well, uh, well, Trump is the commander in chief, so yeah, he it so. is very, very important. So it, it you know, I, America is. Uh, a country that has been phenomenally good to Ireland in a lot of areas. So I don't like to just dump on America as such. It, some American policies are to be condemned. Some of them have been disastrous. But as a country, I think we also have to remember that we have phenomenal links with it, and it has, it has, it has been very, very helpful, particularly on the economic side, to Ireland, and was very, very helpful during the peace process, even uh, when some of, during uh, the implementation of several of the reforms the Americans were very, very useful in making sure that the British government didn't backslide. So it's not all bad. It's, it's a balance. Okay. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I think I can agree with a lot of what Ray has said. If, if we have to remember that the American administration has been good to Ireland and they've been a good friend of the peace process, and we're very grateful for that, and we well, hope that continues. Does that, that mean continues. you should support them Absolutely when not. they are perhaps wrong? 
No, absolutely not. I, all I'm just pointing out yeah. is that they have been a good friend, and that's important. And we don't let, and I know you're not talking about Trump, you're talking about the American uh, uh, government as a whole, but I think Trump in itself is another, a whole new con another conversation, if you like, around his approach to, to everything, his commentary around women, his commentary around you know sexuality, his commentary in, in general is disgusting. Um, but, but that being said, you don't cut off your nose to spite your face, you don't stop engaging with the American administration. But in terms of their approaches, they kept their nose out of some things that would be more appropriate. If you look at Syria, for example, and how they've interfered there, them, the British government and also France, you know, their influence there has been extremely unhelpful. So I think that, um, I don't know if you can take it as a blanket approach as far as you said, are they, I think your question was, are they a threat to world peace? I don't know if you go that far, but certainly you, you, when you look at some of the examples of how they've behaved, then that's very, very questionable. What about speaking truth to power, though? When Jerry Adams goes to the White House, does he take Trump to task about his comments on sexuality, his comments on women, his comments about war, Does, is, is that ever discussed? Of course it is, and that's important. I mean, as political leaders, you don't forget who you are or what you stand for, so no matter what room you go into, you should always make your point heard. I've been to China, for example, on delegations trying to uh, open up trade opportunities, and that's important, but whilst I'm there, I'll also make the opportunity to say that they're the worst human rights abusers, so we as political leaders have to not forget who we are, no matter what room you go into or who you're talking to. Patricia. Um, is America a threat to world peace? Well, certain sections within the United States obviously are, are um, not acting in, in terms of, of the role one would hope that a, a superpower, as we would call them, or as, as we would commonly know them, are acting. I think there are a number of different elements to it. First of all, look at the domestic issues in the US at the minute. Look at the issues around um, uh, the repe repeal of Obamacare. Look at the crumbling support within the Republican Party for Trump. This uh, focus on North Korea is a very, very useful distraction. You know, it's, it's a very useful distraction from the domestic policy issues that the current American administration is facing. And this is something that we see happening on a, on a repeat basis with the American administration. In Obama's time, it happened with the change of the change of tack in terms of whether or not it was going to intervene in Libya. All of a sudden, you know, for many years, Libya was left alone, and then all of a sudden, oh no, we can't we can't have this um, dictatorship continue, and we need to intervene to support the Libyan people. It's always a necessary distraction from domestic well, um, Patricia, events. The, the president's approval rating is lowest recorded in recent yeah. history. But uh, every time you hear Trump supporters interviewed, nothing he has done has reduced their fervent support for him. So I wonder if he's lost a single vote over all these things that you say he now needs a distraction from. Well, I, I actually do believe that he has. I mean, you're looking at um, people... Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not for one second agreeing with all of this when you say that people um, are not losing support for Trump. The, the, the reverse is actually true. People are not seeing the, the change that they hoped. They're not seeing the change... Unemployment's died? It's, Immigration is down? Unemployment is down. It's the same thing as unemployment being down in this part of Ireland. It's down because people are on zero hours contracts or because people are you know, not on the live register. It's down because people are working in part-time jobs. It's not down because of new jobs being created through significant foreign direct investment or, inward invest or, or increased investment by US companies. But it, th there's an issue that I wanted to draw on, and that's about distinguishing the American military response um, internationally from the attitude of American military service personnel domestically. And there's there's um, there's a huge, for me, there's a huge contrast in that. And this comes from, from Drake's experience of, of, of knowing people within, serving within the US military, who, who very much see that their job is around trying to promote what they see as American values internationally. And they're disillusioned. People that I've talked to are disillusioned that they're being used as a political weapon, that the military is being used, it's being politicised by subsequent administrations because they see their job very much about defending international freedoms, and that's not what's been happening over the last number of, of, of administrations. Alex? Um, I think I, I should begin by apologising for words I never thought I would say, but sorry for not being Jeffrey Donaldson. <laughs> <laughs> but, but having said that, if there's anything you agree with, feel free to hum along when I'm saying it. I, I don't mind that either. In, in terms of the, of the United States, I think if you look at the history of the United States, when it was first set up after you know, the rebellion against the British and so on, America became what it always said it wouldn't become. It became an empire. And once you become an empire, 
you start to interfere everywhere. You pick your enemies, you pick your friends, you pick your policies, you pick what you want to do. And uh, Patricia said about promoting American values, that there's somehow there's some sort of God-given right that they must now promote those values, which, to be honest, don't seem to go much beyond as a McDonald's, Disney, you know, Dolly Parton, and so on. That's a sort of Hollywood. Freedom. 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 Yeah, but it, that's not... What they're doing, Noel, I mean, this thing about... If you ask the question, is, are they a threat to world peace? In one sense, no, but they are certainly a threat to the peace and stability of all the countries they have decided they don't like, and the governments they don't like, and the policies they don't like, and they decide, quite literally in some cases, overnight they decide that country is now an enemy of ours. You look back at the 70s, who they backed across Latin America. Some vile, vicious means, paramilitary groups all say, they just decide, we want you in government. We don't care how many people you actually kill. If I will send you the experts to help you kill them, to make it easier. And then you, 10 years down the line, you have a new president who says, oh, well, we're sorry about that. So we'll, we'll shift from, from Latin America to the Middle East or to South Africa or to somewhere else. That's always the problem with empires. And in terms of all empires. All empires, by their nature, end bloodily. They end brutally. They just end in chaos. That's the nature of empires. Pick one. Any empire you can think of in history. The British Empire. It'll end. It, it mostly has British ended. British it, end it, it, it is. It, 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 it's <laughs> ended. No, it, it, ended. it has ended. It has the British, it ended. But it has ended. It did. How many, what, how, how many countries had rebellions against British rule and colonialism? And, and some countries are still doing it. Still one no, away from that colonialism. Absolutely. But um, in terms of you but, cannot get... But no, it sorry. didn't collapse in bloodshed. Oh, oh, oh I'm not That's sure. Well, tell, tell, tell people in Kenya that, no, yeah, that, that it didn't yeah. collapse in bloodshed. But, but, Tell or, people, or tell people in, in, in parts of India did, in parts of well, Pakistan, it did. I'm, I'm saying anyway, that, I'm just that, picking that's, yeah, you, you, Carry on. <laughs> that's how empires end. But look, in terms, you cannot at this minute divorce America and Trump. And I think Ray talked about you know, the, the benign military. I, I remember writing a piece in the Irish News, I think way back, about six, seven months before the election, and said that Trump's campaign was beginning to remind me of the film, you know, Dr. Strangelove, or how I learned to, how, how I learned to love the bomb and stop worrying. <laughs> and I just noted down some of the generals he had in that, you know, General Buck Turnstone, Brigadier Jack D. Ripper, Colonel Bat Guano, <laughs> Major T.J. King Kong. And the terrible <laughs> feeling is that, that some of these people are not as benign as I think Ray thinks they are. And I actually worry, for the first time in my life, most of you, if you've ever read my stuff, many of you know I'm, I'm sort of a natural pessimist, you know. <laughs> I love my children but hate almost everything else. <laughs> but I just have this, for the first time in my life, I am actually terrified about what's happening in America and who's controlling America because, first of all, the president is clinically unhinged, but worse than that, no, you have 40 million people who strike me as being just as crazy as he is. Um, anyone who wants to join in, please put your hand up. I'll get you as soon as I can. Alex. <laughs> I was at a, um, a conference down in the Mansion House in Dublin I think with Michelle, I think it was January, and it was a um, United Sinn Féin's Uniting Ireland project, and I mean that, that was the centre question about Brexit. Um, I think there are two things worth saying. Um, there are many people, and I, 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 def I describe them as soft unionists, soft nationalists, but there's a, there, I can't actually think of a better, a, a, another description. But there are people who, let's call them soft nationalists, they, they're not unionists, they've never voted unionists, they probably will, never will vote unionists, but on the question, of a United Ireland, they will vote for the status quo. Up until now, they will have voted for the status quo to remain in the United Kingdom because they didn't want to rock the boat. There were too many um, issues unanswered, too many questions they needed um, resolved, and so on. Those people cannot be banked in the pro-union camp anymore because while, while we were members of the European Union, I think there were people who weren't comfortable with aspects of unionism, weren't comfortable with aspects of Northern Ireland, how it was governed, but were comfortable enough that the multiplicity, the multi-layer of identity that we all have nowadays was protected within the European Union, that there would never be a time when they would be so isolated and pinned down. They worry. They worry now, but not only because they have a, a unionism in Northern Ireland through the DUP, which they see as um, having nothing to do with them and no interest in, in not even just the respect agenda, but no interest at all in anything which isn't in their own little world. But they're also worried about the fact that there may be, for the uh, considerable future, right-wing governments in England adopting what is, to all intents and purposes, a little Englander nationalism, which doesn't recognise any of their rights or, 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 or views at all. 
You bring that question of a united Ireland. I think Michelle would accept this. If you brought that question of united Ireland five years ago, it would have been a comfortable victory for the union, the status quo. My own view is if there was a, a border poll, no, let me finish this point, Paul. Okay. If, no, if there was a border poll, I still think there would. But people who would, who would not have even considered voting for United Ireland five years ago are biddable now. They will listen uh, to an uh, argument they never listened to before. those in num terms of numbers? Uh, Alex? That, 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 that's a very difficult thing to do because you have to start um, you know, working out in terms of overall vote. If you 70% of the popular, 65% of mm. the population don't vote, 35% don't vote, how you break that down and so on. But you have to take that to mean that there's a considerable number of people 50, 60, 70, 80, 90,000 people who come from, let's, I'm an atheist, so I always find it difficult saying anything, who come from the Catholic population who would be considered to be more towards um, nationalism but don't vote for Sinn Féin or the SDLP, comfortable enough in the United Kingdom, if those people believe that their identity is under threat, if those people believe that their right to be what they want to be is not being respected either by the British government or by a unionist party or parties in Northern Ireland, then those people who would have said, no, 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 we're comfortable enough with the status quo, will actually listen. And what's more important is that, I remember saying this point at the, um, at the conference, those people will prick up their ears when they hear the Irish political mainstream parties and government start to talk about this. Mm. And what we saw last week well, was that, 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 that report. Paper that came out yeah. last so they, they are week, thinking uh, in a way they never thought for the past the, 20 years. The, the, the papers brought out by the Rochdus Committee, which talked about, uh, 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 was it United in Prosperity? Yeah. It's a subtitle yeah. of Brexit, uh, uh, yeah. an island united in prosperity and something other. Uh, unionists, uh, Ray Bassett, called it uh, a wish list. Yeah, um, I actually contributed to that document, a fairly small amount of it uh, on it. But I think, uh, to get back to the question, what Lynn, Lynn asked was, to, I think it has the potential to do, to do both. It has the potential to, to make United Ireland more likely, or it has the potential of making it further away. And it depends how it, it's handled. And I, as, as anyone who reads what I write in the paper, I think it's been handled appallingly so far in Dublin. And I think we've been living in an almost a dream world where, you know, the, the, one of the main... Um, uh, I'm just going to yeah. stop you one second there, because those people who haven't read what Ray said, he basically said that uh, it's time for Ireland to reconsider its position within the EU altogether, and if there were certain elements of, of Brexit, including, what, a £60 billion divorce bill, that, that that would have very, very serious implications for the Republic, and that really this issue needed to be addressed in terms of perhaps the Republic pulling out of the European Union didn't go down terribly well in the Department of Foreign Affairs, I should say. Carry on. Well, I, what I really said was that uh, the Irish government made... <laughs> Sorry, no. What I really said is we made a very bad mistake by throwing our lot totally in with the European Union, saying that, for instance, we were not going to do any negotiations, that essentially we abdicated our, our responsibility uh, to end the negotiations by giving it completely over to the EU, despite the fact that our relationships on this island and between this island and the island, uh, 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 than the, the island of Britain is completely different than any other country. So therefore, we should have waited to see what the outcome was going to be. And... You know, the, probably the, the, the greatest benefit of the Good Friday Agreement, apart from the fact that it cemented the peace, was the abolition of the border. There's absolutely no realistic uh, proposal at the moment which would avoid a border, uh, unless you look, uh, unless you're prepared to sort of widen the framework. Are you prepared to go down a route which essentially will re-establish a border in this country? Uh, or are you prepared to look, say that this is unacceptable, and you follow through that if the European Union doesn't follow that, that you're prepared to walk away because you have to have a bottom line in discussions. Now, I'm not advocating that Ireland leaves the European Union. What I'm saying is that we shouldn't take anything uh, from the European Union. We should say we will reserve our position till, we, till the end of the negotiations. And if certain, um, certain bottom lines are not uh, adhered to, then we reserve the right to move out to a, a Norwegian-style arrangement to the European Union, where we move outside the customs union but stay to a large extent uh, in a free trade area. Or That's what I said. Great Britain. Well, it wouldn't be. It, it, see, it's a logical have, extension people, of that line. No, of thought, people, is it not? no, I think it's complete opposite because people have sort of said that you want to go back to almost the 1973 position. I don't. I want us to. Ireland has changed immeasurably since 1973. It's a much more confident and it's a much more successful country. And I have a lot of confidence in our ability 
to negotiate our position so that we do free trade agreements with both the United Kingdom and the European Union. But the one thing in the bottom line for me, having spent so much time up here, is we can't have a border reinstituted. And all the proposals that have come forward at the moment are essentially wish lists. Northern Ireland is not going to be a special region in the, in the European Union. The Europeans have even rejected. So you have to have a credible plan to get around that and not a wish list. Why, why do you think your thoughts have gone down so badly with uh, the government? I mean, I, I read there was one uh, person saying you should stop calling yourself a former ambassador because you're such an embarrassment to them. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, um, <laughs> funnily enough, the politicians aren't too, too much of a problem. It's my former colleagues. I just don't understand why. But see, in Ireland, I grew up in Ireland when the Catholic Church was a sacred cow. The only sacred cow in recent times has been the European Union. If you criticise the European Union, I was called unpatriotic. Several politicians actually went to see to the newspaper to try and get me stopped from being published. It was, it, it, it was, it was an eye-opener that maybe the, the self-confidence of some of them isn't that deep that they can't take criticism and they can't take debate. If we, do, we weren't having a debate. We were accepting a fait accompli. We saw what happened in the bailout. We saw what happened when Ireland refused to help Cameron during his negotiations. We've seen it time and time again where we've made an assumption. And looking back in retrospect, it was a major mistake. So I just queried one of the sacred cows. And unfortunately, that <laughs> upset the... the it's very the, much the, the sacred cow the, of the The, the Druids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle, uh, I mean, does Brexit make a United Ireland more likely? Good heavens, what are you going to say? I can't imagine. I think, I think it's actually created uh, a new conversation, which is a very healthy one. I think pre-Brexit, people weren't comfortable actually having a, a proper conversation about the future and what it might look like. So if we deal with this right and we chart our way through it right and all the difficulties because we're all very clear that Brexit's catastrophic for the island of Ireland. I don't agree with Ray, I think he is a lone voice in terms of his position that he's taken but that being said... But the, but the point is we don't debate. know whether it's going to be catastrophic or not, isn't that the, the whole point? It's the no, uncertainty think, about it which is more unsettling. If we knew one way or the other then people can make a decision, but no one knows because no one has the slightest idea what it's going to be like post Brexit. Absolutely, and the British government well, has. You just so, so but, you admit but, but, that no, you've no idea no. what it's going to. You're saying it's catastrophic. If you let me finish a sentence, I'll be able to get it out. Wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> It is catastrophic. That's agreed. It's agreed by the... I'm sorry, it's, it's agreed. Not, that's the it whole point. Agreed. It's not it agreed. agreed. You've just it's, said it's not it's, agreed. It's agreed that it's going to be catastrophic because we're going to have the movement of people interrupted, the movement of trade, traditional trade patterns in the end are going to be interrupted, all those things that are well rehearsed, so we know those things are all going to be interrupted. They're going to be different. So we have to find a way to deal with that. The mechanism to deal with that is special status. That's a case that has been gathering a lot of traction across Europe. Ray talked about that Europe have knocked that away. They haven't. I've been out in Europe. I've been in Strasbourg, Romania and McDonald. We've been out talking to other political leaders. We're getting a lot of traction. The fact that Europe have Ireland and the Irish question as the top three issues which need to be resolved shows that they're listening. But, but, but actually, let me finish this. I'm going to let him in for one second. The European Parliament voted by 366 votes to 60 against it. So if you like, I'm, going to, I'm going to clarify that. So what you're talking about, just to be clear and in short space of time, there was a report that went through Europe that um, a group put forward an amendment which referred to special status. There were all of the European leaders, all the other governments were actually voting down the report in its entirety. So that part failed. So I don't think we need to get fixated on that. I'm telling you, the political leaders that I'm engaging with, the other EU27, who are going to be the decision makers? The British government are making the decisions. It's the other EU member states that we need, need to be talking to. So that's why we're out on that diplomatic offensive and talking to, the, to people about it. But you know the one question that they're asking us back? Well, the answer is a border poll. Just go for a border poll, have a unity referendum, and that's the, that's the solution. And what we're saying to oh, them... Very convenient for you. <laughs> and, Michelle, you and Michelle, if you lose the border poll, what happens? But, but, but let me finish this point. So if we, they're saying to us, if we go out and have a border poll, that's the solution. And we're saying yes, we're working towards a border poll. We've said we want to have a border poll in the next five years because the conversation we need to have we don't want to force anything on anybody. I would much prefer we bring everybody with us. So we need to have the healthy debate. We need to talk about how do we shape the future together. Republicans, nationalists, unionists, loyalists, everybody, how do we shape a new Ireland together? Because I think the language is very, very important. Whenever I'm talking about a united Ireland, it's, I don't have a prescriptive view about it, yeah. but I think 
everyone in this room will have a view and something to contribute, but it's not just a nationalist argument, it's a wider argument but because the new Ireland which I envisage incorporates yes. everybody. And you know that the Secretary of State will hold a border poll when he or she believes that uh, there has been significant change in people's views. But if you just look at the election results of this year, I mean Sinn Féin did very well in the first election, the second election the DUP got 300,000 votes, biggest number of votes ever, so the, 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 the lines were very well set again. So where is the evidence that a border poll would produce a different result this time? Yeah, I mean, I think elections are one thing, but I think that's well, why that's we need to be poll is. But, but you, if, you, if you now go into your workplace, you go into a canteen, you go anywhere, people are having this discussion. People are now having the debate about what their future holds and where they think their best place. And people for different reasons, because Alex was very interested whenever he spoke at our Unite in Ireland conference where he talked about some people make a decision about their future based on economics. But some people will make their decision based on an emotive, you know, on their own personal view. How do you protect their Britishness? What does it mean for me going forward? On Monday well, night, not I by joining a United Ireland. But I spoke. You don't protect to your Britishness that way. Yes. That's for sure. How do you know you can? Well, because they, you, how could you? How could you be British if you're part of a, a I, United in, in Ireland? My, in, my, in my vision for a new Ireland, that means that you make sure that people's Britishness is protected. That's the message we need to be sending out. We're not interested in minorities or majorities. We want to make sure it's an inclusive Ireland. And to do that, you bring everybody with you. Just, I just want to very quickly respond to that. Um, I'm not sure you can. If, if there is a means of, of protecting the Britishness of, of present unionists... Change I, the constitution. No, 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 well, let's see the argument made. But the other thing is, I'm, I'm sorry, for unionists, wh wh while there was partition, and I know in this room 99% you objected to it, partition didn't kill off republicanism. It didn't dr kill off the dream of a nation once again. The problem for many unionists, and I would be one of them, is that once you have a united Ireland, even if it's a small majority, you have a united Ireland, unionism is to all intents and purposes dead. That's what worries them. It's not the British so, so much, it's that unionist, that's what they worry about. And no one, Sinn Féin haven't answered it, the SDLP haven't answered it, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, no one has answered that. And you're right, Michelle, we need the conversation. But, it, well, nor is the British government or Irish government. Uh, yes, come back quickly, then we'll get a couple of before I come to uh, Patricia. On Monday night, I was at an event in Castle Wellen, which mm. was a couple of, hundred, maybe 300 members. With your best text buddy, Arlene Foster. <laughs> About a couple of 300 um, people that were in the room, and I was talking to the Methodist people about um, how they saw their. I was just actually, it was an interview about who am I? That's me, me getting to know people, because I have to step out of my Republican comfort zone. I have to go out and engage with other people, so people build up a bit of trust, and people know that I'm not out. You know that I'm out to actually protect their rights and make sure that because. They need to know that I'm somebody that, that they can have faith in. But you they don't do that by in. going to commemorations for the Republican dead. Why do I stop being who I am? Because well, no, I'm, I'm just saying to you that you know very well that when you do that, you get you get and attacked. I, I, because, I get, I get attacked because by, it's the opposite to reaching out, I get attacked, as unionists perceive it. I get attacked by political unionism. And there's a very big difference between the unionist community and political unionism, and we always need to make that it's, distinction. It's not, it's not it, honestly, I mean, Michelle. Yeah. I'm not going to fall out with you. <laughs> But, sure. No, I'm no, you know, you and I, but I'm not going to. There isn't this notion that there's a huge difference between political unionism and some other form of unionism. There genuinely isn't. When most people, it doesn't matter when you go to a poll, it doesn't matter what country you go to, one of the key issues you go, it's on your identity. It's not just the country or the policies or the constitution or the legislation. When you vote, you're voting for who you are, who you want to be. And you ha that question, that's going to be the one that dogs everything. Yeah. Political unionism, unionism, you can't just assume. Well, but, but, that but, can I, 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 plenty of time, but no, no, let me just bring a couple of people in, uh, just because I want to get as many people involved as possible. Sir. On, on the, the last Westminster election, there actually, the, the, the figures weren't reset because for the first time, unionism's popular vote fell below 50%. I think it was 49.5, something like that. So, so that hasn't been reset. Mm. And as Alex predicted in his column, I think in the newsletter before the previous election, uh, unionism did lose its, its overall majority in, in Stormont. Mm. But to come back to your point, Noel, when you said, how can you be British in United Ireland? Yeah. Well, it's the same way that we can be Irish in the UK, because that's who we are. I think just on, on, hands up as well. do, do just on the on the issue of commemorations, the Good Friday Agreement said that everyone has a right to remember their dead, yeah. and that's that's so important. Like we all have different narratives in the past, and I and I won't convince 
a lot of unionist people in relation to my view and my narrative of the past, just like they won't convince me. But if we understand that difference, that's the only way we're going to be able to reconcile. So when I go to a commemoration, I do so to remember the dead, to stand beside, in some instances, like I used this example last night, to stand beside Mrs Campbell, who's almost 90 years of age, who lost her son. So it's done in a respectful and dignified way. We all have a right to remember our dead, but we also have a job as leaders to make sure that we try and reconcile society, that we heal the wounds of the past, that we build bridges for the future, because that's the only way, again, even come back to the Uniting Ireland question and the future, the only way we're going to be able to reconcile people is actually if we deal with the legacy issues and deal with the past. I'm sure that we will come back to the legacy issue through the course of the evening, so I want to go back just to the original issue, or the original question from yeah. Lynn on, on Brexit and whether or not Brexit makes a United Ireland more or less <coughs> likely. Well, if you make a number of assumptions, um, it does make a United Ireland more likely, but those assumptions are th primarily economic in the first instance. They will be things like we will see the ending of the EU funding programmes um, that have funded so many valuable community support programmes throughout the North and that have helped to underpin the peace process. We'll see the um, we'll see the ending of farm subsidies. The, the cap subsidies will disappear from agriculture. Um, the great work that Michelle did when she was in, in the Ministry for Agriculture, especially around fisheries policy and securing fishing rights in the North, that will disappear. So people may vote with their pockets. People may decide, you know, there will be a better future but, in a United I mean, Ireland. Farmers no, voted me. in numbers to leave. It was quite remarkable how many farmers, and fishermen, we've heard them in, in recent that's, weeks saying that's that they, they well can't wait to get out of the EU. That, that that's all very well and good until their produce is is you know they have to pay a tariff on their on their exports. You know when when it comes to the so pocket, they don't understand, when you're standing you're in they Fermanagh, don't understand their own industries. Well, there's I'm saying that they don't fully appreciate the impact that will when 80 percent of farm income is subsidised through cap. Mm. People are not understanding the impact that that the removal of that subsidy is going to have. The removal of that subsidy that you know the impact that it's going to have on everyone in this room when they go to buy milk and butter and cheese and meat. You know, it's going to happen, and anybody who thinks it's not is fooling themselves. So you may, and you know, if you're standing in Fermanagh and you're looking across the hedge into Monaghan, and your neighbour has a brand new combine harvester, you know, you're going to want the key. It's as about simple that. as that. You're going. <laughs> where, where am I getting I've this? I've got a brand new. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it, you know, so there is an argument to be made that people will vote with their pockets, but. In that as well, there's the issue of identity. People are not going to vote purely on economic means or make a decision of that of that significance purely on economic means. So there has to be a process of of allowing people's identity um, to be respected within a United Ireland. And a United Ireland means a lot of different things. I mean, one of the discussions that I've had, you know, when, people, when people from from the south of Ireland say to me, oh, but we can't afford the north, I'm like, well, you know what? In the north, here are some of the things that we do. Um, our children don't have to pay for their books for primary school. Um, our health care is free at the point of entry. It's, no, it's not 50 euro to see your GP. You don't have to decide between whether to buy your groceries, uh, groceries or take your child to the doctor if you're on a low income family. So there are things that we do well. We do need to shrink the public sector, and this is the one thing that concerns me across all of the political parties. There is no acceptance <laughs> by any of them, and I know it's unpopular. The public sector has to shrink in the north, in in any instance, whether you know whether there's a united Ireland or not. But when you have a public sector of the size that it is, it stifles um, economic development. Um, so. So, going back to the issue of safeguarding rights, how do you ensure unionist people who identify themselves as British feel that their rights are protected? Well, you look at the examples of, of where the rights of minorities are protected in, in the Republic of Ireland, most recently through the marriage equality referendum. Probably not a popular subject for many unionists, but you know that's an example of minority rights being protected. And, and if you can expand that to ensure that people um, from a unionist um, community or from a pro-British, people who identify as British, believe and, and are assured that their rights are protected, that there are voting mechanisms to ensure that there is fair representation in government, well then yes, it is likely. You know, all of these things will come together to create a perfect storm. 
But in all of that, if you're looking at enshrining minority rights within a United Ireland, and you're creating a situation where you have something like a, you know, a permanent right-wing alliance of the Fine Gael DUP government in the south, well then, you know, that's not really the sort of United Ireland I'm looking for. Mm. You know, okay. <laughs> so everything has to be on the table. All right, Alex, you want anxious to get in there? Yeah, just uh, two points. Um Briefly, if you can. Uh, yeah, which I will. I, I just think in terms of, you know, there's, we protecting British interest, in, in, interest in, in the United Ireland, protecting Irish interests in, no, in Northern Ireland, if every single um, issue that you have, Michelle, every single respect, agenda, whatever it was, equality, was met by the DUP. If Arlene said, fine, lovely chat on Monday night, we can meet all of those, it wouldn't stop you being uh, a Republican, it wouldn't stop you believing in the United Ireland. And I think the big issue is this, if you, when you talk about the economic thing and thinking with your pocket, I'm pretty sure, just this audience, I'm assuming 99% of you are Sinn Féin supporting, Republican supporting, United Ireland supporting, the ones that, okay, I know you're not, but, <laughs> just... <laughs> So there he is. Right. Want, want, you know, that's Jeffrey. No, if you want, it's always one. If, if, if you made the case, if, if you made the, if you made the argument. Oh shush, no. If you, if you made the argument, if if you were given a convincing, undeniably, palpably true case, that. Northern Ireland, you would be better staying in Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom. I'm pretty sure. And all the evidence pointed to is cost of living, everything, you would still be better in the United Kingdom. I'm pretty sure that if there's a border poll, the majority of you would still, a considerable majority of you would still vote for the United, for United Ireland. And the same with the United so, Kingdom. Shall we take a wee show of hands, Alex? No, don't. If you, <laughs> no, if, you did the same, if you did the same with unionists, if you told them you would be better off in the United financially and so on, the vast majority would still vote to stay in the United Kingdom. And that comes back to my point about and soft unionists and soft nationalists. Those are the people at 15 to 20 percent are now the key players for both unionists and Republicans. And Michelle's right. That conversation is not between Sinn Féin and the DUP, because I'm sorry, they're fixed positions. The real conversation is that 20 percent of people who are saying, prove, if you can prove that our constitutional position would be stronger by giving up our present status quo will listen to you and vice versa. At the minute, what worries me most is that debate has been wrecked because both the DUP and Sinn Féin are not having the debate at all. Okay. They're still kicking hell's bells out Let of each other for no, a no of good reason. Comments, a couple of hands up. There's a gentleman here. Uh, two comments. One is for Ray. I, I, I'm disappointed to see a, an ex-diplomat joining the ranks of pundits and commentators in the South by speaking about Ireland and the country of Ireland when he really means the state uh, of the 26 counties uh, in the south of Ireland. Because I personally think that I live in Ireland, and when I married a male woman, I don't think I married a foreigner. <laughs> well, no. Uh, having, having dealt with three, could have moved to Alex. Alex, uh, you're moving towards a position you enunciated about two, three years ago, but I think not quite as far as you did then. At a meeting, you said that you were convinced, totally convinced, that 99 per, if there was a border referendum, 99% of unionists would vote with their heart and not their head, and that 99% of nationalists would vote with their heart and not their head. If that's true, it's pointless talking about Brexit. Stop the conversation, move on to something else. All right. No, but, but sorry, Jude, it's the, yeah, fine, that's, let's call those the 99% the of people who always vote, yeah, on both sides. What I'm talking about is that 35 percent who don't vote, vote, who can be manipulated yes, yes, one way or the other. Uh, I'll be at the last time. All right. Well, it's well, I'm making it now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Took me three years to make uh, it, but I'm making it. Uh, and Ray, defend yourself. Yeah, and Jude, point completely taken. I I don't want it to come across that I'm not sympathetic. I'm 100 percent sympathetic to what Michelle is saying. I just have. Um, doubts about the evidence to, to, to support in that direction. But your I, definitions he's taking yeah, issue. I, I also take, uh, I take 100% your point. Uh, too often people confuse the state with the, with, with the country. I, uh, my, my son lives in Belfast, I'm up and down all the time, and if I used Ireland in the wrong friends, I abjectly apologise. <laughs> And that's not something you hear very often around here, is it? Uh, okay, let's move on. That was great. That was, uh, that was a good discussion. Let's move on to uh, another point. Now, another question from someone. Alex. No, I've, I've, I've always said that. I think there's any evidence points to anyone. I don't care what their background is, what group they belong to, where they come from, what weapon they use, where they did it, who they did it with. If the evidence points to them, you take them to court. And if the evidence proves that they did it, you lock them up. It's that simple. <laughs> 
as a former victims commissioner? The, the short answer is there can be no amnesty for anyone, whether mm. they're British yeah. soldiers or anyone involved in the conflict. You can't do it under international human rights law, and you can't do it morally, and you shouldn't do it as a society. You should not re-victimise people by allowing people to walk away if there's evidence there that, that can provide truth and justice to families, then it needs to be brought forward. We also need to create a situation but where do you, do you the charge, investigations you, sorry, into the past... Do you charge them with murder, for example? And if soldier who's a you have to look at you have to look at the information yeah. and, the, and the, the information that's available. It has to meet the test under mm -hmm. the law. You can, no one is above the law. The rule of law means that it applies. The law applies evenly to everyone. So if the evidence is there, then yes, you charge them with murder and you follow that through to a conviction if the evidence mm -hmm. supports that. And that has to go across the board. You cannot start creating amnesties or creating further hierarchies of victims because you refuse to prosecute some people because you provide amnesties to certain people. Would you send them people. to jail? If that's what if, the, if that's if that's what if that's what the um, penalty is under the law, yeah. you follow the law. You apply the law evenly to everyone. And, there's and no would, there's no equivocation the, in that. Uh, strictures of the Good Friday Agreement count. We we know. Of well, obviously they will. And if these are deemed got out, so if these are deemed to be conflict related convictions, yeah. yes, they will. Okay, uh, Ray. Ed. Yeah, uh, this, this, this is a very difficult uh, question. In 1923, after the War of Independence and the Civil War in the South, there was an amnesty. There was uh, a, a bill just said that all acts committed during that period would essentially not be uh, subject to conviction. To be honest, I feel myself a bit inadequate in this um, because I've, I've attended so many funerals here. And you know, when you look at families of victims, uh, it just reminds me of what, the, what Jerry sang early on. He said, "You're not sleeping in my bed. You're not walking in my shoes." So you know, I I I don't want to dodge the question, but you know, I, I find of myself in many ways too inadequate to answer that question uh, to people, to families who've who've suffered so much. The situation is messy at the moment. There is a partial amnesty. If you've took part, if you give information about the disappeared, you, you are not subject to prosecution. If you give information uh, into the Savile Commission, you are not subject to prosecution. Uh, I don't have a, s a simple answer. Justice cries out for um, a proper trials uh, at the same time and uh, to, to, to bring that to conclusion. But it's a mess at the moment. And I don't have a pat answer to give to anybody, to be quite honest. Michelle, Republicans would like to bring every soldier, every police officer, every UDR man or woman who killed someone to, to, to justice. And Alex says that would be great. But the disproportionality, as many people see it, is when are the IRA people, the, IR, the INLA people, going to be brought to justice? Well, it's not. It's, it's disproportionate. It's not. It's an absolute myth to say there's a disproportionate approach to how the British government... If you actually look at how many British government soldiers have been prosecuted, I think it's two. Um, so, so there's very, very little. That, that's a complete myth that people I, put out there. I, I think so the disproportionality is in the campaign rather than in the figures. But the campaign is for truth. And there should be truth, and people should have access to the mechanisms which were agreed under Stormont House Agreement. For the first time ever, we had a range of mechanisms, because what, what John wants and what other um, victims want, it can be very different. So for the first time ever, we had a range of mechanisms to deal with the legacy issues. And that is the only way we're going to be able to move forward, and we're going to allow people like John to be able to move forward. We have families, John and, and others, have been up to the steps of Stormont to protest to get access to legacy inquest 46 years later. And the British government talk about national security. Can anybody really say, can anybody really stand over that there's any threat to anybody's national security to give information to help families get access to information? So what we need to see is the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Okay, but it has to work both ways, doesn't it? I mean, Martin McGuinness stood at the Savile Tribunal and said there was a, a, a vow of silence which he wouldn't break on, on the IRA and people have been involved in IRA violence. So it has to work both ways, doesn't it? It does have to work both ways. And what and, evidence and what is Republicans, that it is and what, ever going to work the other way? And what Republicans have said, that if we set up the mechanisms as that were agreed under Stormont House Agreement that are Article 2 compliant, so they're human rights compliant, then Republicans will not be found wanting in terms of participating in those mechanisms. That's that the only way we're going to... they will come forward and say, I know who planted X bomb, this is his name, this is where he lives? There's a whole range of mechanisms, and, and not to get into the details of them all, but you know, you're going to have the HIA, you're going to have the Oral History Archive, you have a range of mechanisms, which families and all need to be brought with us along that, this journey. Mm -hmm. But what we're having is people being denied access to legacy inquests, which is an absolute disgrace. In this day and age, we need to move forward it shouldn't be joined up where the legacy inquest, the coroner has requested funding. It's a funding issue. 
the British government need to pay up and they need to make sure that people, families get access to those inquests now. Mm -hmm. What we need to also see is overall funding for uh, the police ombudsman for the investigations that need to happen. So there's a whole range of things that need to happen. The only but, way but, we're going to be able to move society forward... it is a forward, matter of detail. For people who say that there should be an amnesty for members of the security forces, part of the argument is when will we ever... What will be the mechanisms for finding out who killed the, the victims of Republican violence? What will be that... You say it's, it's not... A, let's not get into the detail. No, but that's a simple question. Would you ever say, I know who planted bomb X, this is where he or she lives, go and get him? Well, I wouldn't know anything about that. Well, I, I, so I, I, there you go. You know what I mean. I'm not suggesting you would, but I'm but saying... You know, what, what, what I'm saying is, the mechanisms, the way to deal with this has been set out. People know what they are. They're agreed. The range of, of um, measures that, that we agreed under Stormont House Agreement are there. They need to be implemented. They need to be taken forward. No, that's the only way we're going yeah, to be able to yeah. deal with it. The strands of, in, of, of investigation, information recovery, and 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 the um, oral history archive are all there. Let's go back to the issue of you called it disproportionality. Let's knock that. Myth. I, I didn't call it that. Well, well that was the, the expression we used. Yeah. You know, let's knock that myth on the head once and for all. There is no disproportionality. I mean, I am sure that there are a significant number of Republican ex-prisoners in this room tonight who have served extended periods yeah. of time in prison for conflict-related offences. So that's the first issue. The second issue is let's talk about things like legacy inquests. We are in a situation where victims and survivors are being forced to use mechanisms that are not designed to investigate conflict-related deaths because of a lack of agreement on way forward on mechanisms that will properly address conflict-related deaths. Families who are going through inquests at the minute don't want to use that system, but it's the only avenue open to them. And then let's look at some of the issues. You have, you'll, you'll have the, the inquest into, into the Ballon Murphy massacre. And those families have had to fight every step of the way for information, for funding, for legal aid, for access to anything. That is being mirrored right at this very moment in time by IRA victims in the Birmingham families. They are going through exactly the same thing in, in England. They cannot access legal aid. The coroner is restricting the findings of the, income, uh, of the inquest. And they are being forced to fight for every shred of information. So let's look at the common denominator there, the British government. Those are who are denying victims and survivors rights to information and to justice. That's where it's coming from. Alex, do you have any sympathy for the, the argument that uh, you know these were men and women who were putting their lives on the line, defending, whether you think rightly or wrongly, they thought rightly, defending the peace in Northern Ireland, uh, and that uh, there has been a disproportionate emphasis on bringing them to justice, not the numbers who've been brought, but on bringing them to justice? Yeah, I, I think the, the difficulty is that um, um, a lot of these people, um, there's no excuse, no justification, they were young people and they had no idea, they'd never found themselves in this sort of situation before. Um, and they did things which were clearly, clearly wrong. They were given instructions, Noel, which I think were clearly wrong as well. Um, I, I think it, at, at that time the British government had no idea what its policy was. It had no idea what it was doing in Northern Ireland. It took it, a while, it, took it maybe 10 years before it finally began to hammer home what, what path there may be towards a peace process. So I think there are young men and women on all sides, all sides, involved, in, whether it was in the security forces or in paramilitaries, and I'm not equating those two, by the way, they're not, but I think who did very bad, very stupid things, and that's what I'm saying. If there's any evidence linked and can be found, I don't care whether it's a soldier, policeman, UDR, IR, I don't care what, what it is, that, that, that needs to be dealt with. But can I just make just a wider point on, com on commemoration? Why it matters. Commemoration matters. Michelle, and I can understand why she goes to, the, to those events. I can understand why you and go. Commemoration matters in a society, and Patricia touched upon it earlier, which is not a genuine post-conflict society. When you have a solution which is, at best, conflict stalemate rather than conflict solution, when you still have so much unfinished business that both sides cling to something. Because when you have finished business, like South Africa and other countries which have managed to end conflicts, the one thing they have in common They've already agreed the constitutional future. They've already agreed the shape and nature of the country. They've already agreed collectively what they want to do together. In Northern Ireland, we haven't done that. Unionists are where they were 50 years ago. Sinn Féin Republicans are where they were 50 years ago in terms of their ultimate political constitutional goals. That's why the whole commemoration thing matters. It's why legacy is going to continue to be a huge problem because when you have unfinished business, legacy is about finishing business. When you haven't finished the political constitutional business, you finish nothing else. And it's the same with amnesty. Uh, Ray's right. 
You can. Um, they, they are in 1923. They did it. Other countries have done it. But the common feature with amnesty in all those countries is that all the parties have agreed on what the future is going to be. And that, that's what we're dogged with in Northern Ireland. We still don't have that common agreement. And I'm sorry, where you have no common agreement, where you have no common consensus, then those big issues, those big ticket issues which dogged us in 97, 98, will continue to dog us. I, I don't want to be too gloomy in this. I don't believe any of them can be resolved. I don't okay. think it's possible. Let's have a voice from the back here. I, I, uh, I have a difficulty with Alex's point that the British state in the early days of the Troubles didn't know what it was doing. I think this is a very common um, sort of um, way out uh, and it, it damages our understanding of the past because very often it was literally the same people here making these decisions in the early 70s who had ran counter gangs, done many of the same things they did here uh, 10 and 20 and 30 years earlier in Kenya, in Malaya, all over the world. So these were, these were practiced uh, practitioners uh, who knew exactly what they were doing because they were simply replicating what they'd done and very often it was literally the same people like, like Kitson. Um, so I think that's... An, uh, yeah, but can, can, I, can I just say, we're not talking about bringing them to justice, we're talking, and Alex is talking about the young people who pulled the triggers or wielded the batons or whatever they did. Of course, but they I just wanted the people to... people who were directing I just wanted to, But I just wanted to widen it out to say that I think that unionism would benefit from that, that broader perspective of the conflict, and that might be a way for unionism to escape this uh, infantilised version of goodies and baddies, to uh, have a greater appreciation of uh, the British state's role in 20th century history and the crimes of empire that Alex alluded to earlier. Okay. I'll let you come back Colin, to that. Colin, just, just let me answer very... <laughs> very briefly, it's worth bearing in mind, Colin, if you go back to that period from 1968 onwards, I've argued from 1968 to um, maybe even 15 years later, unionism, all of it, it's why it fell apart. It's why we had the new fringe parties like Vanguard and the DUP and some of the loyalist extremists emerging didn't trust the British government. They believed, go back and look at the record, they believed that the British government had no interest in keeping Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. They believed that, look back at the language of all those people about rollover, rollover British government, spineless secretaries of state, and barely name one of the first ten secretaries of state or prime ministers in that period who wasn't accused of being a genital coward, an IRA supporter. So union, it's too easy to say, you know, that unions had this infantile view of it, Colin. At that period, having just lost their parliament, and I have no big truck for losing their parliament, parliament doesn't represent anyone, isn't worth keeping, but the issue, at that moment, unionism was scared, it was stupid, it didn't know who to trust. And I'm, I'm not justifying any of that. I'm simply saying it's too easy to say that, you know, oh, and I don't think they ever saw it. I never saw it in terms of good and bad. I think the nature of all conflict, it's very grey, it's very murky. And for long periods, no one knew who to trust. I'm sure even with Sinn Féin, half the time you didn't trust the British government either when you were talking to them. So. <laughs> what do you mean half the time? <laughs> well, benefit of the doubt there. <laughs> all right. Uh, was another question there, was there? Uh, is that Danny, is it? Thank you. I just wanted to ask the panel, should there be any limits to freedom of speech? Um, stating this on the back of Kevin Myers uh, two weeks ago, wrote a column in the Sunday Times for which he was criticised for misogyny and anti-Semitism. Um, and the secondary question is, do, do the panel agree that he should have been sacked from his job? Yeah, okay. Uh, Ray, do you know Kevin at all? Uh, I've met him, yeah. Mm. Do I, do I, I, I must admit, I particularly dislike him, so I mean, I might as well start <laughs> off from the very start. Uh, him or his writing? Uh, or, or both? Both. both. Um, we always, by the way, he's English born, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, freedom of speech, no, there shouldn't really be. Uh, he should have as little curtailment as freedom of speech, but it, proprietors should also be prepared in their organisations to defend um, taste and things like that. Kevin Myers has been writing terrible stuff for years about everybody. It just took that he had to make a, a, an anti-Semitic remark and had to get into the United Kingdom press or in London for him to But some of to his be best friends are Jewish. Absolutely. He says. <laughs> uh, that's true. But uh, no, I think, I think it, it, it shows that you know, that there is sometimes a double standard that what's, you know, here in Ireland sometimes p people can get away with stuff that the minute it hits the, me the mainstream media, he, uh, what do you call it, that it was unacceptable. It's also quite interesting that, you know, he's been a misogynist for years, he's been anti-republican, he's been anti-everything for years, and then he crosses into anti-Semitism and he's chopped, and I think that shows that, you know, um, that 
there are some types of, 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 of sort of prejudices and, uh, and complete bad taste which are tolerated and some that aren't. And I, I applaud them for getting rid of them, to be quite honest with you. But, but in his defense, I mean, he said that what, what he said, I mean, basically, for those who didn't read it, and I can't remember it word for word, but he's basically saying that uh, you know, the, he thought that Vanessa Feltz and Claudia Winkleman probably got pretty well paid because, well, like most Jewish people, they didn't like to sell their services for nothing. And he could say that that was actually a positive comment. Yeah, but, but I why mean, is the, that anti-Semitic? It, it's racist at the back of it. And I know a Jewish people find that very offensive, and I agree with them that this continual sort of putting them in a corner. Western society has been... A, Anti-Semitism was endemic in Western society. You just read Irish government archives, you read Canadian government archives, you need Swedish government archives. So it is a particularly sensitive, se sensitive area. And um, people do not want to be sort of cast into that, that area. And anti-Semitism has had devastating effects in Europe. And people are naturally mm. quite um, sensitive on the issue. Alex, uh, what limits should there be, if any, to freedom of speech? Um, let me declare an interest. <laughs> I, I write two columns, one for the newsletter and one for the Irish News. It's a privilege, it's a luxury, because I have the privilege, which I exercise on a fairly regular basis, of being rude to just about everybody. <laughs> Extremely offensive to just about everybody at one point or another. I am invited to events like this and all sorts of other panels where I speak my mind. I like to think that people, whether they read or hear me, they think that's what he genuinely thinks. If that offends people, it offends people. You can't know. When you write something, you can't be absolutely certain um, that why, why it's offensive, why in that particular moment it's offensive. And all those years I've been, about 15, 16 years, I think, with the present newsletter column, and about three years with the Irish news column, only once have I been censored, and that's when I, I wrote in the column, and I won't describe the politician, but I said he was an irritating gobshite, and they decided... <laughs> they, Did you they, narrow that down they, a bit, they, Alex? I, I didn't actually think it was, was liable or anything, but anyway, they decided that, that was just stepping over the mark a little bit. Um, Can you just clarify, it wasn't Jeffrey Donaldson, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it wasn't. I didn't think that needed clarify, but no, it, was, it, 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 it wasn't. Actually, just to be absolutely clear, if you want a list of people who I think are irritating gobsites, I, I, we could be here all night. So yeah, I think you have to be extraordinarily careful. But what I'm mindful of, and I think what most columnists are, and I don't describe myself as a good columnist, I know there comes a point when you draw the line. There comes a point when you just know this is gratuitous. And I think... In Kevin's case, who I have to say has done some very provocative stuff in terms of challenging what people think of it. It's what a columnist does. You do want to challenge people. You want to, people to go, what the hell is he writing about? You want to make them think. You want them to stop you in the street and say, what did you mean by that? That's what the job of a columnist is. And when I have a go at Sinn Féin, the day, I have a go at everybody. And it's just my nature. But you, you, Sorry, you say you've been censored once, but do you have frequent battles when you say, I really must be allowed to say that, and then there's an editor... From either okay, okay. Saying, no. Occasionally there have been uh, paragraphs which uh, they said were, ooh, were a little bit unsure and I said go with it. The, the ultimate test, the ultimate test for a columnist, for anybody who, in, who writes or it's, it's your readers. If your readers don't like something, you will find out fairly quickly they don't like it. You will know. And it's much easier. Years ago, you know, you had to wait about three weeks till they got round to find the green, the green pen to write and say how useless you were. Now it's done at the click of a button. They can tell you but, within but, minutes. But it's, it's not so, enough but to say it's your readers, because you might write for, you know, Searchlight, the fascist magazine, or you might write for, you know, the socialist worker, uh, and those audiences would uh, listen to or, or approve of things that, uh, you know, the wider society might not. So I, I can't who's the arbiter? Uh, well, the, the arbiter is the publisher, ultimately, because they're the ones who publish, they're the ones who pay you. But in terms, it, it's back to Danny's point, you need to be extraordinarily careful. And it does worry me slightly now. We've moved into a world where people seem to be offended very quickly about everything. You know, somebody comes up to me, somebody came up to me outside in the corn market um, uh, about a year ago. It's Christmas Eve, I was with my, my eldest daughter, and he came over. I said, extraordinary thing, he just shook me by the hand and just said, wanted to tell you, you're the worst effing writer we have <laughs> in Northern Ireland. I, and I, so polite. Yeah, so, so polite, this, this is my mother. But no, the, but the, the, the point about it is, no, you can, it, it's a two-way process. I have the luxury and privilege of being able to write. The, the public have the right, you at events like this, people who c communicate through media, Facebook and things like that. But there comes a point, a, a publisher should know, in Kevin's case, and I read the article carefully, 
it was open. It was open to be misconstrued well, as gratuitous. And when you cross that line, I don't mind giving offence. I don't mind saying to people, you're wrong. I don't mind saying to people, this is what I believe, and try and persuade them, say, mm. look, here's the argument. But you need to be careful of saying, you create a world in which columnists, yeah. writers, are afraid to actually let's, say let's anything. Say columnists That's Trump's side, world. Patricia, I mean, look at the world of social media now. I yeah. mean, the social media trolls, the, the appalling cyberbullying yeah. that's going on all the time. I mean, the, the, it, where do you draw the line? When does that become unacceptable? And when is it just free speech? Well, for a start, there should be no limits to free speech. Mm. But let's let's be careful what we're, we're categorising as free speech. That is a right to give your opinion. Mm. It is a right to challenge people's views. But when that, when that opinion is something that stereotypes or cr unfairly criticises or puts people in danger or constitutes hate speech. But who's the arbiter of all that? That's the question, isn't it? I mean, one Well, under, under the law, it is, is the right thinking... natural truth. But under the law, the right thinking member of society is the arbiter of that. I mean, I wrote a column not that long ago about um, Arlene Foster's interview with the Sunday Independent, where she used a particular word to describe Michelle that I felt was objectionable, because there is... You know, there is a connotation with using that word that is objectionable to women. And, and I think that that stepped over the bounds of free speech. I think that Kevin okay, Myers stepped really over the bounds of free speech. Do you really think that Arlene Foster meant that interpretation? Well, read my described. column and you'll see, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, absolutely she did. I only asked the question. So I only asked but the I mean, question. I mean um, Alex made the point that uh, the role of a columnist is to challenge views. Alex does that very well. Jude Collins does that. Newton Emerson does that. They challenge people's views. But, you know, that's in a way that's respectful. It's not at the point where it's, it's stereotyping, where it's abusive, and where it's nasty. And in terms of social media, well, the best, you know, the best way to deal with that is just don't engage. Yeah, it's yeah. easy to say, but it's all pervasive, isn't it? I mean, especially yeah. if you're a young person. Yeah, but you, you know, you have to. Uh, well, for young people, the issue there is around creating resilience and developing that resilience and giving them the, the capacity to, you know, to be mm. strong in themselves and to be confident in themselves. And that's an issue for young people. But as adults, we shouldn't be engaging in that kind of behaviour. You know, it's, it's really about you know, you play the ball, not the man. Mm. Could you, uh, no, can I just very quickly say that? Just I'm not defending Arlene, but simply, I didn't find. Um, I know you're sitting beside me. I, 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 didn't find, I didn't find the blonde comment gratuitous. What I did find gratuitous and wrote about it was the comment about feeding the crocodile, because I think that did far more damage than it, because for, it was almost like a real yeah. moment. I think the blonde thing, I, I, in, in her defence, I actually think she, I, she may have thought it was just a, some sort of compliment, M M Michelle. I don't think, no, 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 I, no, I said, no, 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 I'm going to write a column about this, don't worry. This you know. is what I, you'll have to wait until next week. That's now. exactly the point I made, one man or one woman's that's insult just, yes. is another one's uh, compliment. But I'm just saying, against that, I think if you, if you were asking me which of those two is the most offensive, I think by a mile, by a mile the comment about feeding the crocodile. And so, so gratuitous, so offensive, that it galvanised another 4 or 5% of, of support. But I mean, when Kevin Myers, the one and only time I ever met him, said to me, oh, who are you with? And I proceeded to tell him where I worked and what I did and what my connection to the host of the event was. He went, oh, I actually meant, like, who are you with? I thought, you know, your husband was the guest. Ooh. Hello? <laughs> Maybe he was chatting, yeah. <laughs> Michelle. There's no answer to that. Well, I, mean, I, I think that, I think that um, either the feeding the crocodile comment or the blonde comment, they're both equally uh, uh, inappropriate comments. They should never be said. I think that fr freedom of speech is very important, but we have to be very careful about our language. Hmm. No, There's no place in society. Nobody should be allowed to get away with being racist, homophobic, being sexist, any of those things. Nobody has a, has a free run to go and do that at any time. So in terms of freedom of speech, that's that's how I would feel about hmm. it. Express your opinion. Try and persuade. Do all of that. I mean, that, that's that's okay. That, that's that's what you're, you you do, Alex. And, and in fairness to you, at least, at least you're, you're, you're fair to everybody. You can take a good swipe. I hate everybody. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, and you, you talked about your gobshite. Fairness is not based on love, it's based <laughs> on bitter hate. <laughs> That's right, yes. Uh, you talked about, we talked about gobshite comment, I remember. Yeah. Car Carly it Cullen. wasn't you, don't worry. I honestly, know. No. Okay, no. <laughs> Carly Cullen got in trouble because she called Megan McDowell a gobshite and then she had to apologise. Because and I have a rule now about Twitter and social media. Mm. You see if I'm overthinking it, don't do it. That, that's just how I, I operate yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Think, 
Just think about what you're going to say, then leave it for 24 hours. <laughs> I'm just interested, uh, Patricia said, you know, right-thinking people. I mean, this is another thing. Who decides who are the right-thinking people who take these uh, arbitrary decisions over where these boundaries lie? Well, it depends what context you're talking. Whether yeah. So in a newspaper, and, and if Alex is writing a, co uh, a so piece, it's up to his editor to make sure that he's not putting out anything that is of that nature, what I talked about, right? Racist or sexist or, or homophobic or anything so else. Editors are right-thinking people. No, but I'm saying they have a responsibility. <laughs> Isn't that their job? They have a responsibility to make sure that, the, that they're doing that. Yeah. So, And then we all as individuals have a responsibility to well, please we what have we say duty. We have a moral duty. We have a moral duty yeah. as a citizen to, to act with, with decency uh, who towards... Who defines morality? That gets deeper and deeper. Yeah. Right. Uh, you're you're uh, overthinking this. A couple this. of questions on the, the front. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. I'm deaf. And so I suppose I'm speaking on behalf of the deaf community here. Um, and I thought it was better to do this here. And I thought I wanted to do this now before anybody else jumps up and talks about the Language Act. So I know some of you may oh, be Oh, I thought we got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you ask the gentleman's name, please? Sorry, of course, uh, John Carberry. John. All right. So, the deaf community here, we do respect the rights of all people's language here. We do, be it Irish, Ulster Scots, whatever. We have that respect for the diversity and for languages. Now, for a long time, and now we believe it's time that our language, and that be is sign language, because sign language can be British or Irish sign language. We have two that we have here, and they've been recognised. They've been around now and here for many, many, many years, since I was born, through childhood, through adulthood, even before me, everybody who is deaf has been signing. So I just want to ask the panel now this evening, what are your views on sign language? Do you think it is important that sign language would have a sign language act, it would be in legislation, to give deaf people the same rights and equality of rights and equality of access as anybody else has in society. For example, tonight we're here, we couldn't be here tonight without interpreters. Yeah, could I, could so I ask having John, that John, uh, John, what's the size of the deaf community in Northern Ireland? Uh, in Northern Ireland there are around over 285,000 okay. people who are deaf. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. No. Uh, okay. So it is a it is a sizable number. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, okay, Patricia. Well, first what? of all, uh, I want to say thank you to the sign language interpreters here tonight. I think it's brilliant. Um, I know just a little bit of sign language and um, some of you may, may know me and my sign name is Tricia. <laughs> um, I have, uh, I have a, a view, a very strong view on this around um, uh, protection of rights for users of sign language. And it's a controversial view, and some people might not like it. Um, I do support an Irish Language Act, um, and I do think that that all of us who use Irish in our homes and in our daily lives have the right to use that in our in our public lives as well. Um, but we do have to acknowledge the reality that it is not a language of need for most Irish language speakers because they also speak English. There's a distinct difference for sign language users. This is a language of need. This is a language that people use every day. It is their only method of communication with the outside world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, their rights must supersede everyone else's rights. So we do need to put into place legislation that ensures that sign language users have the right okay. to access services Michelle. in sign. Yes. Um, hello, John, and thanks for the Thanks for the comment. I've known him for, for many, many years and worked with him on many issues, yes. Um, I, I think it's not one against the other. It's not an Irish Language Act versus a, a Sign Language Act. We need both. It's about a rights-based society, so your rights should be enshrined in law. Okay, quickly, uh, Alex. I would totally agree with both Patricia and Michelle. Interestingly, you say, I think, 80,000 um, people of deafness in Northern Ireland. A quid? 100? Yeah. 285,000. 285, 285,000. That, well, I was going to, I, 
I, I misunderstood because I thought you I thought you meant that, that's that's one in six of the population. one in six yeah wow which is I think bigger in, in, in terms of numbers is bigger bigger than four of the five main political parties um, which is w <laughs> worth worth bearing in mind in all these cases but I think I, I, I do I'm with Michelle on this one in terms of um, um, recognizing the needs of all minorities and I don't wish that to sound disrespectful but I think it is you know if you are a minority you need protected we need to be able to communicate and I have to say I'm slightly embarrassed by the fact that um, Patricia is able to communicate and I can't even do a simple hello or anything like that that should embarrass me and I I apologize so okay right um just to say, uh, my fa my, I have family members who suffer uh, profound deafness, including cousin, and I agree uh, wholeheartedly, Patricia. I just want to say one thing, that an amazing thing happened when texting came about, that a cousin of mine who I would have some communications, but communication was difficult. The minute texting came out, we had a whole different relationship and became friendly. Just to sort of say, you never think of that as a, a side effect of texting. But, I, you know, I, I found my cousin, we had a much closer relationship after texting came in. Down and just found that. John, we may have a sign language act before we have an Irish language act. <laughs> That's for yeah. sure. An Irish uh, language act. <laughs> uh, I think that's our time up. Uh, oh, one more? one more? Oh, fine, great, lovely. And it's where? Yeah, Going along the line. Yes, hello. Stand up and tell us all about you. I'll just sit down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sit down and tell us all about you. <laughs> Um, it's just a question really about uh, going back to Arlene Foster and um, the whole victims issue. Arlene Foster herself is a victim um, of the troubles and I just wonder, does anybody ever challenge her and say, as a victim, why do you not give wholehearted support to victims and challenge, bring forward their case? No one seems to ever challenge her on that issue. Well, have you ever challenged her on it? Well, I mean, I think we have to be very sensitive to all people who have lost or all people who've been injured or been impacted throughout the course of the conflict here, and that includes Arlene Foster. So, I mean, I regularly have a conversation with her and the DUP and indeed the British government around the need to move forward on the on the issues which we talked about earlier and implement the Stormont House Agreement and the mechanisms that were there. So that applies to everybody, regardless of who you are and your background is. So it's something that I very much throughout the course of the talk, this has been the issue which has been to the fore. We've been running really, really hard on this issue because we're never going to be able to help move people forward and actually reconcile our society if we don't properly deal with the issues of our past. Yeah. Uh, the problem, uh, Ray, as you well know, is we can't agree on who's a victim and who's not. That's true, that's true. Definition of victims is, the whole area of victims is a, is a difficult area and it's, it's not, um, it's not amenable to sort of pat solutions and things like that. And, um, you know, um, we, we really have to find a way forward. Now there's several uh, documents and several attempts at it and I'm not sure that they actually all fit the bill when it, com when it comes to it. Um, but it's, it's something that's going to continually dog us right to the future until it's resolved. Go ahead. But Arlene tells us she represents all the people in Northern Ireland, yet she doesn't accept, she doesn't accept the poll and Brexit, she doesn't accept well, well, certain let, people let's, are let's victims. Let's keep to one, to, to one subject, if, if we may. Um, in terms of, of Arlene Foster's personal experiences... Um, Have you ever said to her, you're a victim, you should understand? Absolutely not, I never no. would. Never I would, would never define anybody right. by by the loss that they incurred or by the, the trauma that they suffered, and none of us ever should. Um, that is, it's for Arlene to, to manage as an individual in whatever way she, she chooses, and it is for all of us to be respectful of that. You know, that was, you know, you have to expect respect the trauma that she suffered and, and not use it to judge her and never do that with any victim. Okay. But, I, 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 um, I, you know, I, I she, I, as a public representative, she does have a duty to set aside her personal beliefs and to work for the entire community that she represents. And I think that she needs to do that. I think she needs to get back into Alex. Stormont. Um, I, I, she's I, I, supposed to represent everyone is, this, is this, the central point here, I think, but yet she's differentiating victims. Well, I think she's not the only one differentiating victims. I, th I think um, you and, and Ray both um, mentioned it. We, we don't actually know um, what, what defines as a victim. You know, stop, stop, stop 100 people randomly in Northern Ireland, give them a card and just say, define what you mean by victim. I'm pretty sure you'll get 70, 80 different versions. I'm not even sure. I've known Ireland 30 years. Uh, 
I know, but I'm, I've known Arlene for I've never asked her that question. I've never asked her whether she feels herself to be a victim because I know people who've had um, who've had people shot, I, our friends, family shot. I know um, um, who've said to me, you know, um, widows and so on. I'm not a victim, Alex. No one is ever going to call me a victim, and that's not just on the union side. They will not. They don't want the status or definition of victim to define them. And I don't think anyone. You can't expect anyone, whatever their uh, political role they find themselves in, a public role they find themselves in, and to say, "Well, you yourself experienced that, so you must surely be mindful of everyone else," because you you then start this game as of. of is everyone equal? Are all those circumstances equal? And on both sides, we don't agree on that. It goes back to my original question about, or the original comments about amnesties and commemorations and not being able to settle things. Still 30 years on, and I think the, the, the definition of victim I first heard about, I think it was 92, 93. Here we are, almost 30 years on. We still don't have a definition that both sides or all sides or anyone will sign up to. So no, you know, I, I'm not, again, I'm not defending Arlene Foster, I'm not defending anyone in this, I'm simply saying, I, maybe it's not an unreasonable, it's the wrong word to use, but I certainly wouldn't expect Arlene Foster to imagine that it's her job to be responsible for people who she doesn't even regard as victims, even though they regard themselves as victims. Stony okay, silence. Ladies and gentlemen. No, not a stony silence. It's just I'm waiting the signal from the boss there to say that we have overrun our time <laughs> by a few minutes, but that's pretty good. Uh, thank you all for your interest and your comments. Sorry I didn't get around everyone, but that's always the case in a night like this. I'd like you all to show your appreciation for our panel, please.